I'm Ian Murray, and as you know, I'm going to be talking about Markov Chain Monte Carlo. So just before I start, could I have a show of hands? Who has actually used MCMC in their work already? OK. And I, I know from talking to some of you this morning, and some of you haven't. So to those that have, I apologize that it might be a bit slow. Hopefully, you'll get something out of it. But um, I'm going to give a, an overview of just why we would do Monte Carlo of any sort at all. And for those of you who already no MCMC, you might not see anything new until maybe the second lecture even. So you've seen a lot about big probability distributions and graphs in, in the morning. Um, so I'm going to start with something very trivial. This is, I think, probably the first statistical problem given in high school, which is uh, how do you find the mean of a bunch of objects? So if I was interested in knowing the average height of a bunch of people, I would go and measure their heights, and I would add them up, and I would divide. Right? And, um, or if I was interested in some other quantity, it's just the same algorithm, their IQ. Or, um, uh, for some reason, John Wynne has asked us all whether we're left or right-handed for the practical. So there are people who actually go out and do this sort of thing. Um, now, the danger of going to a lot of um, technical lectures about graphical models and probability distributions is that you end up adopting a funny language. So let's say instead of knowing the height of lecturers here, I was interested in knowing the average height of people in Cambridge, then that's a sum of the height of each person summed over all people in Cambridge divided by the number of people in Cambridge. And when you go to these lectures, you now adopt the language where you say, this is an intractable inference problem because it's a very large computation. Whereas we know that you know, this isn't a difficult problem. Um, all you actually need to do is just go and grab a bunch of people, look at how high they are, average their heights, and you'll have a pretty good idea of what the average height of people in Cambridge is. Um, and for a lot of the problems that we bluster about how difficult they are, it's just as easy to, to solve problems we're interested in. So if you've got any integral that's an expectation, so it's an integral over a probability distribution of some function, you can play exactly the same trick. Instead of actually on your computer visiting every little element of your space and measuring the height of your function and adding them all up, you can just take a bunch of samples from the distribution that you're averaging over, take the empirical average over the S samples that you gathered, and get a pretty good idea of what the integral is. And that's the idea of simple Monte Carlo. That, that is all Monte Carlo is. So as an application, say you, were, you had a Bayesian inference problem, and you had some data, and you wanted to make a prediction about some new quantity, then this Predictive distribution is just an average. You look at the posterior distribution over the parameters in whatever your probabilistic model is, and you say, well, if only I knew those parameters, I would know how to make predictions. If I, someone told me what the ground truth of all the parameters in the model is, I would make predictions. So I do that for every setting of the parameters and weight by how probable they are. And again, you, just, you can do it by just sampling the parameters from their distribution and taking empirical average. So Monte Carlo has an obvious application whenever you're doing Bayesian inference, if integrals like this are difficult. Um, it also has applications in all sorts of places where probability distributions come up. So if you ever fit parameters using an algorithm called EM, then you often need to compute statistics. This can be written as averages. And Jeff Hinton next week might talk a lot about Boltzmann machines, and the Boltzmann machine learning algorithm involves this sort of sampling average. Okay. So we can perhaps be a bit more formal than saying we just grab a bunch of samples and, and look at the average. We can, we can say properties about it. So the, we can look at the expectation of this estimator, and it's trivial to show that this is unbiased. So um, on average, this estimator will get the right answer. Um, and you can also say, well, how, big, how much will the estimator deviate from the true answer? So you can compute the variance of the estimator. And what's nice is that it shrinks with the number of samples. So if you want a better answer, you just gather more samples. You don't have to go and implement a new algorithm. You just wait longer. Um, and because this is a variance and we're normally interested in error bars, the error bars shrink with the square root of the number of samples. So although you just have to wait longer, you end up having to wait longer and longer. If you want your error bars to be 10 times shorter, you're going to have to wait 100 times longer. So there's a trade-off. OK, so I saw, I saw this example a long time ago. I'm sure a lot of you will have done. But a concrete example of how sampling works. Say we want to approximate pi, which is four times the area of this red um, area, if this is a unit square. Um, 
So we can write this as an integral, which is the integral of the indicator function saying, are you inside this area, averaged over a uniform distribution within this square. So this is like the most stupid way of computing pi you can possibly imagine. Um, so pi is equal to four times this integral, and you can now approximate this integral by sampling from the distribution, which is throw down points in the square, and then just see whether you get a one or a zero. Are you in this red circle or not? Um, and so without knowing anything really about geometry, you can get with 12 samples that pi is about three. And that's sort of the feel of Monte Carlo. You can just get a few samples and you get a general idea of what's going on. It gives you a ballpark figure, which can be good to sort of sanity check if you're doing something else like EP or a different approximate inference algorithm. If it gives you a completely different ballpark number, you know you've done something wrong. You can also be patient and wait longer. So I could draw 10 million samples and I would get that pi is 3.14 something, but it's not very accurate, and this is never going to be a way to get really precise numbers. So if you're interested in that, you probably don't want to be doing Monte Carlo. Um, I mean, specifically, if you wanted to compute pi by numerical integration, you could just use numerical quadrature, and with only 100 evaluations or maybe 1,000, you can get pi to sort of as accurate as you can represent. Um, so you really don't want to be doing Monte Carlo for this sort of, uh, sort of integral. And it, this was summarized by Alan Sokol, who's a, a funny guy. And he, this, was, this quote was the opening to his lecture course on Monte Carlo methods. Um, and he has actually done an awful lot of good work in Monte Carlo methods as well. And I don't completely agree with this quote. Well, I sort of agree with it. But I think you could replace Monte Carlo with anything, because um, if x is a method, it should only be used when all the other methods are worse. I think you can agree with that for any x. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, and so I, I think that that's a question that you want to sort of be asking yourself. In my practical, I'm going to try and get you to sort of look at a problem where doing Monte Carlo actually makes some sense. Um, there's other practicals that are, will be looking at other methods, and you know they'll be looking at problems where they're appropriate. So the question is really, is Monte Carlo the right approach for you? For you, and maybe the way to find that out is that you have to implement it and compare. You do the sanity check of whether the numbers are in the right ballpark, and then you go for the fast method, or you go for this because it's the only thing that works. OK. There's actually an, an, another motivation for drawing samples. Um, we concentrate a lot on sort of numerical computation just because it's a concrete thing to do. But I just think samples are pretty. So uh, th this is a figure from David Mackay's textbook. Um, and this isn't a machine learning application, but there are people who are interested in tiling shapes. And it's a whole sort of field of geometrical combinatorics. And so this is um, a problem where you pack lozenges inside a hexagon, and you randomly sort of create. You can think of this as a hod that holds bricks that are sort of in a pile that are filling it, if you can see that optical illusion. Um, and this is a random sort of way of stacking bricks into a hod. Um, and when you just glance at this, you can see that the sort of this circle forms. And there's a whole literature on describing the properties of this circle. But you might not notice it was there unless you just looked at samples. You, you could have found that this circle exists and described the properties of it just by doing mathematics. But you know that it's something that you should go and look for by just glancing at the sample. And for us, I think if you can visualize what your probabilistic model is doing, and you can draw samples, and it might give you hints of sort of things that you should go away and you should do. Um, so here's a, here's a really simple example. Um, it's a sort of, it's by now a bit of a toy problem in machine learning, but um, here are some very um, low resolution binary images of digits. And these are samples drawn from probabilistic models that have been fitted to the digits. So that, these here are 16 samples drawn from a model which is a mixture of multivariate Bernoullis. So this is a probabilistic model that basically says, the way I'm going to generate an image is I'm going to pick some template exa exemplar image, and I'm going to add a bit of noise to it, and then that's going to be the image I spit out. So the way that you explain any image you see is you say, this is a bit like one of my templates, and it's a bit different, so I'll explain that by noise. And when you draw samples, you see they're really noisy. And so that immediately tells you that this sort of model underfits. You can't explain all of the variations in digits by just 100 templates, which is what was fitted here. You need to have sort of a more flexible model that can capture all of the invariances that you get in, in the images. There's, there's actually a long history of this sort of just eyeballing things and seeing how things turn out. So um, Monte Carlo methods really took off in the 50s when there were the first computers. But before that, 
Fermi, who was a physicist, was always astounding his colleagues because he would come in and he would say, oh, I think that this neutron experiment will come out like this. And he was often right, and he, his answers are in the right ballpark. And it's because he was up at night with a hand adding machine running Monte Carlo simulations on his desk without a computer. Um, and now we've got the computing power that we can just do these things trivially, so you know, we really should. So for us, if we've written down our model as a directed graph rather than as a sort of series of dynamical equations for ne neutrons, we should know how to, to sample from our model. And if we've gone the route of writing down a directed graphical model or a Bayes net, as some people call them, then the algorithm is really simple. And I'm sorry, I missed Stephen's lecture, so I don't know if he went through this. Um, so the way that you would sample from this Bayes net, which was in Stephen's slides as a running example, is that you first just sample all of the parents right at the top. And we know what their distribution is because when this graph is giving us a joint distribution which tells us what these distributions are. And then we sample all the children once we know what their parents are just from the conditional distributions that we've written out. So this graph just gives us the natural generative structure. I mean, that's one of the reasons they're great for modeling. So once we've gone to that effort, we may as well then see what it does and see if it's captured the things we wanted it to. Okay. So how do we actually implement that? How do we do this ancestral pass and draw all these variables? And the short answer is that you know, we just use MATLAB. Or we, <laughs> we use whatever our computing environment provides because it's going to have implemented in it already a lot of these standard distributions that we use. So drawing from the prior is going to be simple. And if your library didn't provide these functions, and there's a good book which you can just download that explains how a lot of these algorithms work under the hood. Um, so this is sort of old established stuff. But we're going to have to understand how a couple of these library routines actually work because that's going to sort of tell us how we're going to improve on them. And that's um, unless you really know what's going on, you, you can't move forward from there. So here's a really standard way of drawing samples from a distribution. You have some probability density. And you just sample uniformly points underneath the area from this curve. So you just there's, a, there's an area here, and you just choose something randomly from inside there. And then if you read off the location in the input space you're interested in, that's your sample. So the reason this works is just that um, if the curve here is twice as high than here, then there's twice as much area underneath it, and so you're twice as likely to sample it, so it respects the distribution. And the way you implement that is you notice that, say, this point here has about half of the probability mass to its left. And this point here has, say, about a sixth of the probability mass to its left. So this amount of mass that's to the left-hand side of the points is actually a uniform random variable. So you implement it by drawing this uniform random variable and then working out how far through the curve you should be. So mathematically, what you do is you work out the cumulative distribution of the curve, you draw your uniform random variable, and then you shove that through the inverse cumulative. So I say in MATLAB RAND, it gives me 0.7. I read across to this cumulative curve. I read down, and that's my sample. And that's great as long as we can actually compute the blue curve and invert it, which we can do for Gaussians and exponentials and simple 1D distributions, but we can't always do it. So if you look inside the source code for something like a gamma random number generator, depending on which library you're looking at. It might do a series of horrendously complicated things, depending on which parameter regime you're in. And one of the things it might do for some of the parameter regimes is um, rejection sampling. So we want to sample points underneath this blue curve. That's our distribution. And we don't know how to do that, because we don't know how to compute this cumulative and invert it. But we do know how to sample from a bunch of other distributions, like Gaussians, uniform distributions, piecewise uniform distributions. So we get some other distribution that we do know how to sample from, like a Gaussian. And we scale up the function such that it's always above the blue curve. Then we sample from the green distribution, the Q distribution, and we pick a random height uniformly so that we're sampling points underneath this green curve somewhere. Now what we're doing is we're sampling points uniformly under the green curve. If we toss out all the ones that aren't underneath the blue curve, then we'll just be left with samples drawn uniformly from the blue curve. So the algorithm is draw a sample. Oh, it's above the blue curve. Reject it. Draw a sample. It's underneath the blue curve. We keep it, and we have a sample. <laughs> 
Um, so this is, this is pretty general. The only technical requirement is that you need to be able to bound this function because you need to be able to construct this thing that will be above it everywhere. Um, and the only problem with it really is that it seems a bit wasteful because you do all this computation and then if you have a rejection, you just sort of throw it away and you get nothing from it. Um, and potentially you can spend most of your computer time just sort of computing these functions and then doing nothing with that computation and throwing them out. So there's a, a trick that means that you never have to reject samples. If, you, if you're in a regime where you can't draw samples from the distribution you want to, but you can draw from some other distribution, important sampling is a trick that allows you to just sample from the distribution you actually want to instead. So you have an integral to solve. This is what we want to estimate. And we multiply by q, which is the distribution we can sample from, and we divide by q. So this is just multiplying by 1 as long as we never divide by 0. And so this is an identity. And now this is just an integral, which is an expectation under q. And the function is this whole object here. So now we just apply simple Monte Carlo. We sample from q, and we evaluate the rest of the integrand. Um, and what's nice about this trick is that actually your integral didn't need to be an expectation in the first place. You'll notice here that nothing about this relied on p here being a distribution. Just think of fp together being the integral integrand, and that just sticks together. You could do that with any integrand. It wouldn't have to be an expectation. Yeah? Well, how to choose q? We could choose q like 1 and sample from a uniform distribution. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. How do you choose q? So I've said you can choose any q you like, one that you can draw a sample from as long as we don't divide by zero, so that there's that technical requirement. But um, it's probably clear that some q's are going to work much better than others. Um, and so there's sort of a question of why and how we might pick them. So I mean, if we had an input space and this was our true distribution, and you know we're interested in the average of some function which runs, runs through the space as well, then clearly, if we picked a distribution that had most of its mass over here, then the samples over here aren't going to tell us much about the expectation of this function under this distribution. <laughs> so we're going to want a distribution that has its mass in much the same place. Um, and something else we want to really avoid is making q small when p is big. So, for example, imagine what a variational, if you know about variational approximations, what they would do is find a mode and seek into that. So if I did a Gaussian approximation to this, under some cost functions, I would fit a Gaussian around the tightest mode. Now that means I'm very rarely going to get samples over here. So now if I do, very occasionally I'll get a sample here. And now I evaluate the importance of this sample. And the importance is P over Q. Okay, so now in the tail of the Gaussian, Q is really small, and P is quite big, and the importance of this sample ends up being absolutely enormous. And so that means that in this empirical sum over my samples, maybe one of the terms will be hugely bigger than any of the others, and effectively I've only drawn one sample. So what you want to do is construct a distribution that <coughs> roughly covers the distribution, and make sure that it's never really small where there's appreciable amount of mass. It's fine to have your key distribution have a bit of tail where there's no mass, because you'll just occasionally get a sample out there and give it no weight, and you've wasted a bit, but nothing blows up. So the question is, um, in rejection sampling, we sample from this arbitrary distribution, and sometimes we say, oh, we sample here too often because our Q is big here compared to P, so we'll throw them out. And here, we're just softly rejecting because we downweight them a bit, but it looks much the same. And it's just slightly more efficient in that it's soft. So if we're not interested in the samples themselves, we're interested in this expectation, then it's lower variance to attach a real number to every single sample you've got than to make a hard decision of I'm going to weight the sample by 0 or 1. Um, so if you compute the variance of the estimators, this turns out to be more efficient. Sorry. It looks for me that the easiest way in, uh, 
the best way to choose is just uniform distribution, which is um, with a constant on the top. Yeah, so, so if we can bound the function, say this is the biggest thing, and we know the extent of it, we could just have a top hat like that. If, if P was something like a Gaussian that has infinite tails, then our uniform distribution would have to go out forever and then it would be improper and we can actually sample from it. Um, but you're right, if the distribution has compact support, then you know, maybe a uniform distribution would work fine. It depends on the problem. Sometimes you'll have clever tricks where you know really tight bounds of the function in some places. And there are also adaptive rejection sampling algorithms that sort of can form a really good approximation for you on the fly. Right. So on the previous slide, I assumed that we could evaluate both P and Q. Um, and that's not actually always true. So if we have, um, I'll wander over here. <laughs> if we have a parameter posterior, posterior parameters given data, then we can normally evaluate the likelihood, the probability of the data given there parameters. We can normally evaluate the prior on our parameters because it's often something very simple. This might be evaluating a joint probability under a graph or something, but it's usually fairly tractable. What we don't know is this thing on the bottom, the normalizing constant, the marginal likelihood of the model, or the evidence for the model, probability of data it has many names. This thing here is a difficult integral to compute. So normally, what we like are algorithms that work with a distribution that's proportional for something we can evaluate, and we'd like to drop constants. So there's a version of rejection sampling that works when you don't know the normalizing constant of the distribution. And it basically works by pulling out a ratio of normalizing constants from P and Q and separately estimating that. But it turns out that you can estimate this ratio from the same samples that you've drawn. And what's neat is that approximating this ratio turns out to be equivalent to working out all your importance weights and then renormalizing them so they add up to one. So you run this algorithm, except instead of weighting by P over Q, you reweight by these things normalized so that over, if you sum over all your samples, these things add up to one. Um, it's a few lines to show that this is a valid thing to do, but... Um, I'm sure you, you'd be able to, to work that out, and if you can't, I can show you afterwards. OK, so what I've talked about so far is just plain, simple Monte Carlo. I haven't mentioned anything to do with Markov chains yet. And so this is just the summary of what I've said so far. And I'm, it's great that I've had lots of questions, so I think hopefully you'll have a good idea of what's going, going on with what we've covered. One thing I would say is, why would we ever do rejection sampling? So there's a question of, why do important sampling? Because it looks much the same. So I gave a reason why important sampling is better. Um, why did I bother to tell you about rejection sampling? Any ideas? <laughs> so um, imagine that I'm one of these people doing a physical simulation, wanting to look at the output of a system. And it, the dynamics of it involve a sequence of um, draws from random number generators. So, I know that when this particle diffuses, its next step will come from this distribution. Then for my simulation to make any sense, I really want to be drawing from specific distributions. And um, it will be much harder to interpret if I have a load of weights attached to everything and they're not coming from the right distribution. So there are times when you actually want real samples and that's what rejection sampling is for. Okay, so why aren't we done? Like I've just said, uh, Monte Carlo is a super general thing. You can work out any integral you want, and I've given you exam uh, algorithms that can sample from any distribution. Um, the reason it's not the end of the lecture is because the simple algorithms that I've showed you don't really scale up to the sort of problems that we're interested in when we're solving inference problems. So I have two examples here. If you have an undirected graphical model, then you can't sample from it with one of these ancestral paths. There isn't this sort of nice, directed interpretation of it. So if you have a large undirected graphical model or a Markov random field or defined by a model defined by a factor graph, then you're not able to just draw a sample from that distribution even to look at it. And this is a very high dimensional distribution. So any, any algorithm that's just designed to work in low dimensions isn't going to work. 
Similarly, even if you have a directed model and you're interested in actually looking at data rather than just looking at how pretty it is, um, if we condition on a variable and then we want to know the distribution conditioned on that, then again, we have a distribution where we don't know the normalizing constant, it's a high dimensional object, and this looks as though it's going to be a tricky distribution to sample from. So it, it might not be obvious why rejection sampling and important sampling don't work in high dimensions. So as a toy example, imagine the distribution we were interested in was a spherical Gaussian distribution. We just didn't know it. So we could evaluate this distribution point-wise, and it happens to be a spherical Gaussian, but we didn't know that. So we're going to use a different distribution, Q, which is a different spherical Gaussian in order to either do rejection sampling or important sampling. OK, so now we can say, how well will these algorithms work? How long will we have to wait before we can accept a sample and rejection sampling? Or if we're doing important sampler, how good will our estimator be? So for rejection sampling, to get the bounding, it turns out that Q has to be wider than P. Because if it's narrower, then you end up multiplying it by infinity to make it above it everywhere. So you have to make it wider. And imagine that P is slightly different from a normal distribution somewhere so that you can't quite fit it to be the same width. Then the fraction of the proposals that you end up accepting falls off exponentially with the width of Q. So if you just have a proposal distribution which is slightly wider or slightly misfit in some way, in high dimensions, it means that the number of proposals you accept can just drop towards zero. Like if you're in 100 dimensions and sigma is 1.1, then you're going to be waiting a long time for all your samples. Um, it takes a few lines to show this, and to be honest, this might be wrong because I did it last night. But um, the variance of important sum, uh, the importance weights is this or something like this, and I'm sure it's going to scale exponentially with um, sigma. So if you're doing important sampling, then the variance of your estimator also blows up if you have a distribution that's too wide. And then for the reasons I explained, you can't have a distribution that's too narrow either, or that's going to give you problems. And that turns out here, if sigma, t if, if sigma ends up being really small, then you end up with the variance blowing up too. Um, and you don't even need to be in that high dimensions to begin to think, get some intuition that these algorithms aren't the right thing to do. So I've got here a very, very toy data modeling application. I'm doing linear regression, and I'm pretending I didn't know how to do this analytically. Um, so I have a data set, and I have the green line, which is a randomly drawn regression line. So I'm doing important sampling, and I'm saying, I'm going to draw a whole bunch of possible lines, and then I'm going to, from an arbitrary distribution that considers sort of all, all lines, and then I'm going to weight them using important sampling to say which ones actually fit the data so that I can approximate things under the posterior distribution. So most of these lines are rubbish. Like, you know, they have nothing to do with the data, and so their importance weights end up being really small, like 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 51. And only a few of them, by chance, actually happen to sort of go through the data. And so a very small number of them pick up most of the importance weights. Um, of course, this would be much more extreme if you had a, more than two parameters. I fixed the noise here, so it's only sampling from two parameters. Um, and notice what happens. So I, the algorithm's running in this order, although you could do this in parallel because there is no ordering, really. But you know, I draw this sample, I draw this sample, I draw this sample. I finally get one that's any good. And then I completely ignore that and continue drawing from my dumb distribution, and so draw a silly one again. I get one that's OK, but then I make it worse again, and I make it even worse. And I never learn from what I'm doing. Um, and surely, once I've sort of got a line that's in the right ballpark, I should be able to do something with that. So as a lot of you already know, um, the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo is to come up with algorithms that instead of just randomly drawing IID proposals from distributions, you instead evolve samples um, and take smaller steps. So here is an algorithm that we'll go into more detail later that does something different. Instead of drawing samples independently, it proposes small changes to what you've currently got. So now there is a time ordering to this algorithm. It's running along here. So we started off with this green regressor here. And the algorithm just perturbed that and proposed a different regressor. And it's colored red to say, oh, that looked worse. I'm going to reject it. So it kept the same regressor. It didn't throw it away. And it came, proposed a different proposed, um, regressor. And it was still there, so it kept the old one again. <laughs> 
And then eventually, a small perturbation the other way produces a good regression fit. And once it's in the right ballpark, small perturbations tend to be good. And so you get a sequence of reasonable samples that look as though they might come from the posterior distribution over regression lines that go through this data set. So this is um, a series of pictures in data space. And then in terms of the parameter space of our model, the algorithm looks like this. You've got parameters for the, uh, that describe where the line lies. And the algorithm is moving around the space of parameters. Um, and the red lines show that sometimes you propose to a point in the parameter space which has low posterior probability. And so you don't go there. You, you stay where you were and you, you move somewhere else. Yeah. Okay, so the question is, is this the same as hill climbing? And so what I literally said sounds like that because I didn't add any stochastic element to it. So I said, you know, you perturb something and if it's better, you go there and if it's worse, you don't. And that would be, you know, a, an optimization method that some people call hill climbing. This algorithm says, if you tweak it and it's better, then definitely go there. But if you tweak it and it's worse, then sometimes you might go there anyway. And so that stops it from being an optimization algorithm. So we're not going to be doing maximum likelihood or map. We're not going to find the best parameters. We're going to tend to move towards the better parameters, but we'll also sort of randomly move around a bit. And that's what's going to let us sample from the posterior distribution. So at the moment, this is Voodoo. I haven't explained how this works. I'm just saying this is the flavor of the algorithm we want. And then over the next few slides, we'll understand where it's actually come from. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. So what's the difference between simulated annealing and this algorithm? This algorithm predates simulated annealing. So this algorithm was invented in the 50s in, at Los Alamos when they were doing, developing nuclear weapons. And uh, simulated annealing, I think, was the 80s. Um, and simulated annealing uses this algorithm in its inner loop, but then it does something else to change the distribution at each iteration. So this is a key part of simulated annealing. OK, so here's the key idea of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. We're interested in some probability distribution, and it might lie in a high dimensional space. We can only evaluate it up to a, a constant, um, but we can evaluate it point wise up to the, a constant wherever we like. And we want to construct some sort of random walk or diffusion process that will explore this distribution. So we'll initialize our walk in some arbitrary way because. Often these problems are intractable. We don't know where good places in our parameter space are. So we initialize in some way. And then we're going to follow a Markov chain. That is, the way that we draw the next step only depends on the previous step and nothing else. Um, so we have a probability distribution over where we go next, given where we were before. And using that simple rule, we're going to want to take steps that wander around. And eventually, after some burn-in period of sort of finding the distribution, will explore the distribution such that if we looked at where all of the points of walk visited are, which are these blue dots, after a while I stopped drawing the black line and just put a blue dot wherever it went, those blue dots look as though they're samples from the distribution we're interested in. So what we're interested in doing is constructing Markov chains, finding transition operators or distributions T, that if we were to simulate these Markov chains have this property and will draw samples for us. These samples are correlated, highly Yes, they are. Yes. So I, more they're not fair samples, right? Is it? And what's fair? Um, <laughs> so the, the, the question is, are the, the samples are correlated, and, and so in some ways they're not fair, or you know, there's, they're maybe not as good in some sense as independently drawn samples like rejection sampling gave us. And, and that's all certainly true. Um, it turns out that if you put these correlated samples into the simple Monte Carlo estimator, then ignoring this issue with burn-in, um, maybe we'll get onto this later, um, it's still an unbiased estimator. So you don't need independent samples to construct it, uh, estimates of expectations. But certainly, you shouldn't treat them as if they are independent. So if you're doing something that requires independent samples, then this isn't good enough. Um, there are methods of using Markov chains to then produce independent samples, which roughly tell you how long you have to walk for before you can draw another sample. But, I don't know if I'll get onto that. Uh, the variance would not decrease as fast as it were. Right. So I said that you can use them in the estimator and they're still unbiased, but it's been pointed out the variance is not going to be as good. So um, 
here's a process for me giving you correlated or dependent samples. I draw a sample using rejection sampling. I then copy it and give it to you again. I then draw another sample from rejection sampling. I then copy it and give it to you again. So I give you a series of samples where every, every other sample is the same as the previous one. Now, marginally, all of those samples have come from the correct distribution. And you can tell that if I throw those into the Monte Carlo estimator, then the mean is going to be exactly the same, right? I'm going to get the same answer. But if I assume that I had twice as many samples as I really had to construct error bars, then I'll be really overconfident. So we can't construct error bars in the way that you would for simple Monte Carlo. We're going to have to estimate how many effective samples we have. OK, so I've got a really simple example just to um, show you what the Markov chain dynamics actually mean. Just so that we know the meaning of t. So our stationary distribution is going to be a discrete distribution that only has three possible states, one, two, and three. And they have probability three-fifths, one-fifth, and one-fifth. This is the distribution I want to sample from. Here is a transition matrix which will allow me to sample from this distribution. So the meaning of this is that if I'm in state two, which is this state, with probability half, I'll go to the more probable state. I'm not going to stay where I am, so if I don't do that, I'm going to go to the other state. And state one, which is the most probable state, sometimes just stays where it is, and sometimes it wanders off to the other states. So the reason that I can use this transition operator for this stationary distribution is that, in jargon, p star is an invariant distribution of t, which means that if I multiply this vector by this matrix, I get the same vector back again. So the distribution I'm interested in is an eigenvector of this matrix with eigenvalue 1. Um, and so if I were to uh, start in some arbitrary state and work out the probability of where I would be after 100 steps, then I can do that by multiplying by the matrix 100 times. And to machine precision, you get out that the distribution over where you end up is this. So um, if you apply a transition operator or a matrix many, many times to a vector, then the distribution over what you end up with is its um, principal eigenvector. Um, now, we're not actually going to want to construct these big matrices because we're going to have a very large state space and the problems we're interested in. And if it's intractable to deal with something order n, which is the size of our state space, then we're not going to want to construct an order n squared transition matrix. So we tend to have just some compact way of writing down what our transition rule is. Um, so we tend to write, instead of matrix equations like this, we'll tend to say that what we want is that if we were to draw a sample from our distribution, averaged over that, if we then took one step with our transition <coughs> operator, the distribution over where we'd end up is the same. So you can imagine if somehow this algorithm manages to be sampling from the correct distribution, then if we take another step, the distribution over where it will be after that step is also the correct distribution. So this is a basic consistency condition that this random walk is going to have to satisfy. Um, this condition by itself isn't actually enough. So um, imagine that your transition matrix is the identity matrix, or the operator is wherever you are, stay there and don't move, then that's a bit like the draw a sample and copy operator that I told you before. If you only ever applied the copy operator, then you would never move anywhere in your space and you would never draw new samples. But it would satisfy this condition because if you draw a sample and you stay put, then you, where you end up is the right distribution. So we need another condition on top of this which basically just says it is possible to move around the whole state space. You are going to sometimes move to every place. And as long as you impose that, then these two conditions together give you something that satisfies the properties that I asked for in this picture. OK, so during the break, um, it's pointed out to me that just as I was rushing towards the break, uh, this, this, some of this isn't so clear. So there's a difference between what I wrote down here and what an actual sampler actually does when you're implementing it. So. If you're running the code of one of these samplers, you're actually simulating a Markov chain. So you start at a particular place in your state space, 
And at every state of the algorithm, you're just considering where, where you are now to draw a distribution of where you're going next, and you'll go to one particular place. And so what it looks like is, as I drew, a sort of a path that runs through your state space. Um, what this is computing is the probability distribution over where you would end up after 100 points. So if I start in one of the states with probability 1, that means that I will definitely be in that one state. Then if I multiply by t, that gives me the distribution over the next step. If I multiply by t 100 times, that gives me the probability distribution over where I'll be in 100 steps. So if I were to run this algorithm many, many times, I would end up in a particular place each time. And then if I were to look at the frequency of how often I was in state one over those many ensembles, that would be three-fifths and, and so on. Okay. So importantly, when you're running this algorithm, you don't actually have to visit every point in the state space. Remember, the idea of sampling is that we're just going to get a few places in the state space, and that's going to give us an idea of what's going on in our problem. So if our algorithm had to visit every point in the state space, it would be a useless algorithm, because we may as well just enumerate them all at the beginning. So what we want is that the probability over where the algorithm ends up, it could potentially see every point in your state space. And that's sort of what means that it's, it's valid, because we're able to sample from a distribution that's, that's fair, that could sample from anywhere. We're not actually going to do that. And so we shouldn't be, when we're analyzing the algorithms or looking at whether they're going to work, we shouldn't actually be saying, oh, well, is it able to sort of recover these frequencies? Does it visit every point in our state space with the right frequency? Because most states, it's never going to visit. The number of times it goes there in a run of your algorithm will be zero. OK, so how do we actually do this? I said that we want a transition operator that satisfies these two rules. And for this problem with three states, I wrote down a matrix that happens to satisfy this, this rule. I mean, you might ask where I plucked that matrix from. But um, I said we can't write down a quadratically sized matrix. So how can we come up with a transition rule that will satisfy these properties without having to do some computations, which are as hard as the ones that we're trying to avoid? Um, and it's a bit like the opposite to the problem that you're usually given in mathematics classes. So in mathematics classes, they will give you an operator, and they'll, they'll derive the eigen values or eigenfunctions or eigenvectors of this operator. Um, here, we know, what, um, we know what the eigenvector we want is. And now we have to construct an operator that has that eigenvector. And we have a lot of choice in how we could do that. We just need to be able to do it in some tractable way. So there's a principle which a lot of people use, and this is usually in the introduction to books on MCMC, that allows us to construct transition operators that have the correct stationary distribution. And that's called detailed balance. It's actually a very simple principle. Imagine that you've got some walk through your, your state space. So this is the trajectory of the algorithm. And you just look at two adjacent states. So at some time, it was in state x. And the next time, it went to state x prime. So you've got a pair of two adjacent states. The probability of seeing that pair in a very long run of the algorithm is the probability that this would be drawn from the stationary distribution, because this long walk is exploring the stationary distribution, multiplied by the probability that given you're there, you will transition to x prime. So that's what we got on the left-hand side. Detail balance says that this joint probability of this pair appearing in this order x to x prime should be the same as seeing the pair in the opposite order. So it should be just as plausible that you would see this picture, a long random walk which at some point goes to x prime, and then transitions to x. So that's a way of saying that this, sort of, this walk process is time reversible. It doesn't have a preferred direction. It's just as likely to end up here and go here as the other way around. Um, and so the reason that this makes things easier is that we just have to check this condition for every pair of states. We don't have to, in order to check this condition, we don't have to do a big sum over all states or anything like that. Um, and this condition implies the one we want, the stationary distribution condition, because we just sum it both sides over x. So the left-hand side summed over x is that. And when we sum this side over x, this here is a probability distribution over x. And probability distribution sum to 1, so that sum just disappears and we're left with this. And this is the distribution that we wanted, the condition that we wanted. Okay, I'm seeing some nods and some puzzled looks. <laughs>
it's a, it's a mathematical condition, and it happens to satisfy what we want. And if you're puzzled for the moment, you can just take this on trust. <laughs> it's reasonable. Why? why? So there is, no, there is no problem that all, like we need to um, sample from some distribution which, um, or which doesn't, you know, no. So is it some reasonable assumption or it's not an assumption? Is it some assumption uh, or not an assumption? Okay. I'm not sure what the question is, so I'll replace it with a different one. <laughs> and, you can, and it might be the same. So this is a necessary condition. Uh, sorry, it's a sufficient condition in that if you have this condition, then the thing we want follows. It isn't a necessary condition. Okay, so this doesn't have to be true for this to be true. And that always bothered me. So you read these books, and they give you this sort of magical rule, and they say, make your chain satisfy detailed balance, and then this will happen. This is a sufficient condition, but not necessary. And you're like, well, what, are, what do the other transition operators look like? Like, you know, if, if, if you can have transition operators that don't satisfy this, then what do they do? And I think it's unsatisfying that most of the books don't tell you what the, the necessary condition is. So here it is. Um, <laughs> so imagine that, first of all, this is going to be something which is necessary, and then I'll show this. Uh, that, okay, imagine that you've got a transition operator which does satisfy the property we want. We're going to start off as that as our starting point. Then for any such transition operator, we can define another transition operator in the following way. We say, construct a different transition operator T tilde, where the pro if you're in X prime, then the distribution of going to X is proportional to this thing here. So we can always do this. We can say we need to define a probability distribution. So we're just going to assert it's proportional to some positive function, and then we'll renormalize it to make it a distribution. Um, if the state space is discrete and bounded, we can definitely do that. You might worry about whether you can normalize it in general. OK, so we've, that's what I've done. I've just done this general thing we can always do. I've invented a new probability distribution. And then I can say, well, what is the normalizing constant? I'll just sum this over all values of x, which is what the distribution is over. So here is the normalizing constant. OK, this is looking a bit like Bayes rule, so it should be fairly familiar. Um, now, this thing here is the one side of the stationary condition. So because t that we started with is a transition operator, then this thing here just returns the probability. Okay. So now I've defined a new transition operator, which is equal to this. And it's completely <coughs> general. You can always do this for any transition operator. Now, if I just multiply both sides by this, then I get this condition. So this looks just like detailed balance, except there's a tilde here. So for any t, you're going to have this satisfied with a t tilde here. Now, this, where this thing, for reasons that, that I won't go into now, is called the reverse operator. So now if you get this and you sum both sides over x, then you get the stationary condition returned again. So that's exactly the same as the detailed balance proof. Um, and t tilde disappears, so you don't actually have to work out what it is or, or have it in your hand. So for t, any t that satisfies stationarity, you must necessarily have a condition like this. And then similarly, if you can find a t tilde that satisfies this everywhere, then you can sum over x and show that t satisfies the stationary condition distribution. So this is both necessary and sufficient. And it's only a really small tweak on this picture. In, this picture said, if you run the chain for a long time and you look at a pair of states and you work out the probability of that pair appearing, then that same pair should appear just as often the other way around. The general condition just says, if you've got a transition operator and you look at the probability of a pair, then there must exist some other transition operator, which could be the same one if you want, but it could be a different one, for which the probability of getting the pair in the reverse order is always the same for all pairs. So if you have something that tends to like to walk in some direction, so it's not time reversible, then you just need to identify something that tends to like to walk in the other direction, such that it all matches up to, to satisfy this condition. Now, you don't always use this. A lot of times, detailed balance is actually the most convenient thing. But 
more and more I'm finding this the useful identity to use, and I think it should be, well, the textbook should replace their detail balance section with this. <laughs> so uh, isn't this ad hoc to check as the original, I mean, just the condition? Um, so the question is, isn't this hard to check? Because, I mean, maybe you have to look at every point in the state space to check the condition. If you had to explicitly enumerate all states and check each of these separately, then yes, it would be hard. So the idea is that hopefully we'll be able to analytically show that this condition holds simultaneously across all x without having to you know, compute them or enumerate them explicitly. So we'll see explicit examples where this is satisfied without having to do any computational work. Okay, so here's the explicit example. Um, so this is more or less the motivating algorithm I showed you where I didn't explain what was going on. I just said we're perturbing our parameters and we're, we're wandering around. Um, Metropolis invented the Metropolis algorithm in the 50s and then Hastings, who was a statistician, slightly generalized it in the 70s. Um, for a long time, this algorithm was more or less synonymous with Markov chain Monte Carlo. So um, it's... It makes sense that it's the first algorithm you've learned. And the transition operator is defined in the following way. Just as with rejection sampling or important sampling, it's really good if we can sample from some convenient distribution, one that we've got a library salt, um, a generator for. So we're going to sample our proposals from a distribution Q. But unlike rejection sampling or important sampling, where Q just drew a new independent sample each time, this proposal distribution is going to depend on where we currently are. So we're currently at x, and it's going to propose an x prime. So an example of a proposal distribution could be a Gaussian distribution with mean where we currently are and some noise. So instead of drawing from some global distribution that's got a fixed mean, we're going to just add noise around where we are now. So that's how we're going to propose the next step. So I might go there. But before I do that, I work out an acceptance probability, which is some expression. Um, and that gives me a probability where I decide to either move to that place or I stay still. So in the parameter inference algorithm, this was the bit where if the new state was more probable, then it turned out that with probability one, I accepted the move. And if it was worse, this ratio, which I haven't unpacked yet, will tell you that sometimes you shouldn't take, take that move because it goes to a low probability place. You should just stay put. Okay. So... There are two terms in this ratio which match that intuition that I said. There's the term on the top says the new state should be probable and the old state should be less probable. So if the new state is more probable than that, this ratio will be bigger than one. There are also terms to do with these proposal probabilities. And this is where this idea of reversibility and detail balance comes in. So this is an algorithm that satisfies detail balance. And so that means that it has to be time reversible. So if I don't have a nice symmetrical perturbation like this as a proposal distribution, I can pick any Q I like. If I have a proposal distribution that really likes proposing some particular part of my space, then if I'm not in the part that it likes proposing, it doesn't look as though it's going to be very time reversible because it will propose that I go over there where it likes. But if I go there, it's never going to propose that I'm, I should go back to where I am now. And so it looks very unlikely that I'm going to time reverse just as easily and satisfy this detail balance. So this ratio here is constructed to make the detail balance relationship hold. It says it's better to take the move if it's easy to go back, and it's worse to take the move if it's easy to, um, it's worse to take the move if, it, if the proposal that you're currently considering is a very common proposal. Um, and it just turns out that if you substitute the transition operator into the detail balance relationship, then it, it, it holds, and you can just show that analytically. So for you later, I've put in very small type the proof. But the main thing to know is what this mysterious T actually is. So I'll write that big. Um, so in order to substitute it into the relationship to check it, we need to know what this probability distribution is. If we're currently at some state, what's the probability distribution over the next state? And so under this algorithm, it's just, well, first I've got to propose to go there. So that's Q. And then I've also got to accept it. So I multiply by the probability of accepting given that I've proposed. And that's this min 1 ratio thing. So just A for the acceptance ratio. So that, this is the definition of T. And if you substitute that into the detail balance relationship, you see that it holds. 
probability of staying in the same place. Okay, so this is the probability distribution for x prime not equal to x. If it's a continuous state space, then um, you're never going to propose to stay exactly where you are. You also have to show what's the probability of staying still, and it's 1 minus the sum of all of that. Um, OK, so this is very easy to show. If you substitute this into the detail balance relationship, you immediately show that you satisfy it. Then if you're transitioning to the same place, you suddenly worry because you think, to work out the probability of staying where I am, I'm going to have to sum over all places I might propose and reject. And that's a big sum. But fortunately, any move that says stay still <coughs> is automatically stationary because of the reasons I said before. If you don't move anywhere, you leave whatever distribution you have invariant. Um, and so you, that checks trivially, and you don't have to do any big sums. Right. So. I don't like going through code in lectures, but I put it in the slides so, because I like it to be explicit what I'm doing. So this is the entire code of the demos which go on the next slide. And it's an implementation of the metropolis Hastings algorithm. So it just says, input a state, perturb it using a Gaussian distribution. And you make the decisions about whether to stay or go by evaluating a log probability, which doesn't have to be normalized. So you pass it a function handle. So it's a general algorithm you can run for any problem where you can pass it a function handle saying, this is my log probability up to a constant. OK, so then I get the code on the previous slide, which is MATLAB or Octave, and I create another function which will plot the course of running this algorithm to explore a Gaussian distribution using different proposal distributions. So the game we're going to play is we're going to try and draw correlated samples from uh, zero mean unit Gaussian using this algorithm. So obviously we should just draw these samples directly, but if we draw samples from a distribution we understand, then we can see what the properties of the algorithm are. And the steps that we're going to propose are around where we are, and we're going to perturb the position using a Gaussian of different widths. So the parameter here is the width of the Gaussian that we're going to use to make our walk. So. If I perturb with a Gaussian of width 100, then say I initialize the algorithm at the origin, then typically I'm going to propose moving to sort of plus or minus 100, sort of, which isn't very probable under a unit Gaussian. So on almost all iterations, I'm going to reject the move and stay where I am. And then just by chance, my perturbation is going to draw a small value, and I'm going to perturb my current position by a small amount, and I will accept the move. And then I will stay where I am for a very long time again. So if your proposals are always proposing that you go to very low prob probable places, then you have very low acceptance. And you get acceptance rates of, sort of less than a percent. And so now we clearly don't have very many effective samples in our estimatable. Uh, you know, we shouldn't have very good error bars. We certainly shouldn't assume we've got 1,000 samples. OK. If you make the size of the proposal, the proposal smaller, then you start accepting a lot more, and you start really bouncing around the state space. So here, the width of the proposals is similar to the width of the distribution that we're actually exploring. Um, you notice that we don't actually always accept. So the reason that we don't always accept is our proposal distribution isn't the same as the true distribution. It's got the same width, but it's centered around where we currently are, which means that sometimes we'll propose going further out than is reasonable if we're currently in the tail. OK, so this looks good. We, we accept more, and we reduce the step size. So maybe we should reduce the step size again, and then we'll accept even more, and maybe that will be good. Um, so this is what happens if you make very, very small perturbations. So now, um, as we're moving, at any given iteration, we only travel a very small distance from where we were at the previous iteration. And given we, where we were at the previous iteration was a reasonable place to be, where we will be at the next iteration will be a reasonable place to be. So almost all moves are accepted. In fact, in this round of 1,000 iterations, only two moves got rejected. Okay. And this is a very bad thing. So in rejection sampling, you just want to accept as often as possible. Here, the fact that we hardly ever reject is terrible, because the rejections are actually the only thing that tell us about the distribution that we're wanting to explore. So the algorithm is taking an arbitrary random walk. It's proposing by Q, and it has nothing to do with the problem we're interested in. And then there's an accept-reject stage where it says, do I want this move or do I not? And that bit of information, the yes, you should take it or no, you shouldn't, 
is the only input to the algorithm about the distribution you're interested in that you get. So if you always get the, almost always get the same answer, you're not being told anything about the distribution you want. In fact, this is almost exactly just a Gaussian diffusion using steps of this size. And it's just been kicked twice in 100 of the runs. So this run here hardly has any effective samples. It doesn't spend much time beneath zero. And if you use a long run using this algorithm in an estimator, it will also have very poor properties. So the optimal acceptance rate isn't 100%. It's for various theoretical reasons, it's a bit less than 50% on a lot of problems. And so people often equate values of 45 or 47% or something like that. Um, about a half is what you're aiming for. Um, and it's not going to be too critical. Like, this looks fine, even though it's a bit too much. Um, so, so why is it a bit less than half? I, I thought that the half seemed reasonable. That would sort of maximize the entropy or the amount of information. <laughs> the question is why. Why is it less than a half and not a half? So there's an argument in David Mackay's book of why it should be a half based on information theory grounds, which is sort of the argument I was regurgitating that, you know, you get this information input about the function as this bit, zero or one, and surely the maximum information is the maximum entropy where you, zeros and ones are equally probable, and that's a way to extract most information. It's a bit more complicated than that because the pieces of information you're being given aren't independent because you know that you're going to be close to where you were last time. So that's why that, that argument, although very nice, isn't you know, exactly true. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of complicated mathematics to do with stochastic processes that derive the less than half, um, it, assuming certain regularity conditions on the distribution and so on. Are all the like, algorithms which say all should adapt sigma during the process? Or? OK. So the question is, maybe we should change sigma because um, if we're, perhaps if we're running at a sigma that was far too big, we notice that we're rejecting all the time and we know that we should take smaller steps. And maybe if we were suspiciously accepting all the time, we should increase sigma. Um, and there is certainly a whole literature on adaptive Monte Carlo algorithms. I mean, there's a, there a special issue in a journal recently on adaptive MCMC. You have to be very, very careful about how you do it, though. Um, so if you change sigma in an arbitrary way as you run the algorithm, then you aren't going to get the correct stationary distribution. Um, and I'm not sure if I can con construct an example of this. There might not be one true sigma. It might be that depending on where you are in the state space, sometimes a small step size would be good and sometimes a big step size would be good. So if the contours of your distribution look like this and you had a very large basin and a narrow basin, then you know, maybe you want to take small steps here and large steps over here. Now, if you um, have a fixed sigma, then magically the algorithm will spend the right amount of time in this room and the right amount of time in this room. If you wander into here, start rejecting a lot, and then reduce your step size, then you'll stay in that room for longer than you would have done otherwise. And so you upset the distribution, and you end up staying longer in places where you would adapt to have a smaller step size. So you can't do it in an arbitrary way, but there are ways of doing it. Yeah. Uh, can you say something about um, combining different transition operators? I don't know if you're going to say that. Um. <laughs> yeah. OK, um, so I'll do the slide that is before that, and then I'll, I'll do that. Um, so the next slide was just, I don't want you to get a misconception that perhaps for some sigma, as in this picture, you can almost draw from the distribution exactly. So here, if you wait a few iterations, then you're almost drawing independent samples. It's mixing very, very quickly through the space. And it looks as though as long as you set sigma correctly, you'll have something which is close to ideal sampling. That isn't actually true, because we're not interested in these toy 1D diffusions, and real problems are harder. So um, it's very common to have correlations amongst our variables. If we didn't have them, the computations wouldn't be so hard. Um, and so our distribution might impose constraints on sigma that aren't very satisfactory. So if we have a dumb proposal where Q is a spherical perturbation around where we are, and the contours of the distribution look like this, then you're not going to be able to make steps that are sort of 
much bigger than the largest, than the smallest width of the distribution, or you'll forever be stepping off this manifold of high probability. So the shape of the distribution might limit your step size if you only have one of them. And then given that you've clamped to that step size, it might take you a very long time to diffuse up and down the distribution. Um, so I think there's, there's figures in David's book and maybe Chris Bishop's book as well that um, argue that in this situation, if your step size is sigma and the length scale that you need to wander along is L, then it's going to take you L over sigma squared iterations to sort of wander up and down. This is sort of the properties of a, a random walk with steps of this size. Um, so it's going to take you many, many iterations to sort of explore the whole sp space and make it such that the probability distribution over where you end up is potentially anywhere, which is the property we want to, to draw samples. I should, I should just, I'm drawing all of these toy pictures. I didn't want to spend too long on any particular application because there are so many other lecturers that are doing specific things. But um, an example of where you might get a distribution that has this shape, you're doing linear regression. You've got a current regressor. This has an intercept um, C and a slope M. Then if we move the intercept up independently, then the whole curve will fall off the manifold. But if we change the slope simultaneously, then it might look a lot more reasonable. So these two parameters are going to be anti-correlated. So almost the simplest model you can write down with two parameters, you look at the posterior, there's going to be a strong, in this case, anti-correlation, but you know, an ellipse-shaped posterior. So combining operators. <laughs> I said that the, there might not be one ideal sigma to use. It might partly depend on where you are. And so one thing you might question is, well, perhaps sometimes I could use one and sometimes I could use another. Um, and so we need some way of being able to use different transition operators. Um, and it is actually fine to just invent as many transition as operators as you want, which could be 10 different versions of Metropolis Hastings, all with different step sizes, and just apply them in turn. And the reason it's okay to apply them in turn is because doing that leaves your stationary distribution invariant, which is the property we want. So imagine that your initial condition was drawn from your stationary distribution. So you've run a chain for a long time and you've got a sample from your stationary distribution. And you apply transition operator A. So you go from this initial condition to X1. What's the probability distribution over where you end up? Well, you sum over all of the places that x0 could be, weighted by their probability, and then you look at the distribution given those of where you would go. And because ta is a valid transition operator, that's going to be your stationary distribution. OK. Now we apply a different transition operator to x1 to go to x2. We look at what's the probability distribution over where we end up. I think you might see where this is going. You get you average over all of the places that the previous step could be, for which we've already worked out its distribution, and then you see that it's the stationary um, condition again, and so x2 also has the stationary distribution. You apply a bunch of operators that leave the stationary distribution invariant, and you leave the stationary distribution invariant. So it doesn't matter that these are different operators. We can just concatenate them all together, or we could pick them randomly, and then our transition operator would, if we had k transition operators, our effective transition operator would be 1 over k sum over the transition operators. It would just be the average of them. A nice fact about this is that um, there were two conditions that we had to satisfy. One was that we had to have this stationary condition. And one was that we had to be able to get anywhere in the state space so that we didn't sort of get stuck somewhere. For this concatenation to be OK, we just need the stationary condition. And then the concatenated operator of applying A, then B, then C is going to be together a valid operator. So what you can have is some operators that only move in some of the space, and some operators which are only able to move in other subspaces and concatenate them together. And that result, as long as that combined thing can get everywhere, will be a valid operator. So that might be a bit abstract. So an example of that is Gibbs sampling, which I know about more than half of you will already know. So 
Gip sampling is another MCMC algorithm. It's a way of defining a transition operator that moves around the space. And it works by getting a multivariate quantity, so a vector with two components, say, and successively drawing each dimension from the conditional distribution of that variable conditioned on all the other variables. So if I'm currently at this point here, then one of the moves says, I'm going to work out the conditional distribution along this slice where x2 is clamped. Um, and that conditional distribution will look like this. And then I will make a move along here. And then once I've done that, I will take a slice in the other direction and work out the conditional distribution in the other direction. And so all of the moves only move along the axes. Okay. Now, any of these individual moves if you were to apply that lots of times, couldn't get everywhere in this space because it's constrained to lie on this slice. But when you put them together, it's possible now to walk anywhere in the space. And that's why the overall thing is a valid Monte Carlo algorithm. Why is it good? Sorry? Why is it good? OK. Why is it good? So this is probably the most popular Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. Um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is that it's sometimes very easy to implement. So there isn't a step size to pick, you noticed. There is, there is maybe a free parameter in that you could choose the parameterization of your problem in the first place, but that's complicated. Most of the time, people are going to stick with one parameterization and apply give something. So one of the conditional distributions of a variable given all of the others it's just proportional to the joint probability. So imagine you've got a big graphical model, and you're interested in updating one variable. For each different setting of that variable, you can evaluate the joint probability of the whole graph as it is with that one variable changed. And all of the um, graphical models are set up to do that. They define a joint probability distribution up to a constant, at least. So this conditional distribution, you can write out what it's proportional to. And then if your variables were discrete, you can just explicitly normalize that. And you're only summing over all settings of one variable. So if you had a binary variable, this is a sum over two terms. So this distribution isn't hard to compute. And often, for a lot of models with continuous variables, the conditional distributions are simple things, like gammas or Gaussians or things that we have sample, samplers for. So for a lot of problems, applying Gibbs sampling looks fairly routine. You can derive all of the conditional distributions in closed form or in a form that there's an algorithm to sample from. Um, and then you just run through each variable, resampling it in turn. Um, and an example of, why, of how routine it is is that there are very long-standing software packages for Gibbs sampling and graphical models, where you define your graphical model, and then it will derive the Gibbs sampler for you, compile it into a program, and run it. Um, and it also, both of these programs, um, bugs come with diagnostic tools that help you sort of see what's going on as well. So that's one of the reasons it's very popular. If I go to a, stat, uh, I've been to a stats meeting where a good fraction of the posters said blah 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 with wind bugs, <laughs> um, and you'll also sit in talks where they'll say, so we define this model, and at this stage we could do everything in bugs. And then we added this bit, and bugs couldn't deal with that. And so we had to go and code up some MCMC ourselves. <laughs> so the, the sort of a good fraction of problems could be solved just with Gibbs sampling alone. And Metropolis Hostings is, yeah, I'm sure I just didn't get it. So it's, um, it's different how, right? OK. So Metropolis Hostings didn't sample from conditional distributions. You, you moved a variable by doing an arbitrary proposal queue and then deciding whether to accept it or reject it. And it's not one algorithm because it depends on the choice of Q. And Q could be something horrendously complicated. It could be go off and run some big approximate inference scheme to like, approximate your whole distribution, sample from that approximation, and then decide whether to go there or not. <laughs> or it could be perturb where you are with a Gaussian. Um, and so you can't really compare to the Metropolis hostings. In some applications, people will have a really good idea of how to pick Q, and so it will be the best approach, because you can't beat the domain expert who's come up with really good moves. Um, in other applications, not so much. One link is that one way that you can show that give something is a valid algorithm is you can say, well, what if I used Metropolis Hastings and proposed moving using this conditional distribution? 
And if you substitute the conditional distributions into the acceptance ratio in Metropolis Hastings, then the acceptance probability is one, always, for any move. And that means you don't actually have to check it. You don't have to draw a random number to accept or reject the move. You know that the move will always be accepted. Um, so that is one way that people say that you can see that it's immediately valid. Yeah. So when you talked about combining operators, you said uh, the combination of the operators is a value that the CMC operator. Yeah. What can we say for the sample uh, in between? Like, say you have a sequence of give sampling, and then at the end, when you combine that, it's a valid operator. But what about the sample in between? Do you keep them? What, what do you do? OK. So the question is that um, in my description of how to concatenate operators, I said that you have a few together, and that object is a valid transition operator. So you don't need to go away proving this ergodicity property for each one. But mm, the way that we tend to run MCMC is that we will actually look at the intermediate samples after applying each one, and is it OK to use those? So we can imagine that we've got a block of transitions that we've applied, and then we had another block of transitions, and we had another block of transitions, and we've got saved the states after each individual transition and at the edge of each block. And we could wonder that maybe we should only use each of these samples. Now, each of these samples, as long as you've run the chain for a long time, is going to marginally come from the correct distribution, because this whole object is ergodic um, and each operator satisfies the stationary condition. Um, so the, given that this was drawn from the correct distribution, these ones will also come from the correct stationary distribution. It's just that there's no way that you could get from here to anywhere else in the state space. But marginally, this will still have the correct distribution, only because it's tacked onto a whole thing, which is ergodic. Um, so it is true that you can use all the intermediate things, as long as stuff that came before allowed you to say that this marginally came from the correct distribution. I think that's right. I've never been asked that before. <laughs> OK. So, ooh, time. <laughs> um, let's see if I should say anything closing. <laughs> <laughs> That is for both lectures. <laughs> um, OK, so I've given you well when to just through straight Monte Carlo why we want to be sampling at all and the ways that the standard samplers that we have in MATLAB and other packages work. Um, and hopefully, the motivation of why they're not good enough for the problems that a lot of us will be wanting. We're interested in high dimensional problems that don't have a lot of tractability about them. So these MCMC algorithms they tend to make local moves. That's not always true. They can sometimes make big moves. But if you have algorithms that always try to make big moves, they tend to suffer from the failures that rejection sampling had. Luckily, we can concatenate operators so we can make big moves and little moves and make sure that we get everywhere. Um, and as with Gibbs sampling or this dumb Metropolis algorithm for which I gave you the whole code, they're very easy to implement. Um, they're harder to diagnose, and I'll talk about that more in the second lecture. Um, but in principle, you can go away and code them up and run them immediately. Um, probably the easiest approximate inference algorithms to implement. Maybe not the easiest to run. Um, so I'll be around for the, the whole two weeks. So um, those of you who already know a lot about MCMC can come and talk with me. I'd love to talk with you about your problems. And uh, those who haven't seen this before, also any questions anytime. Thanks very much. <laughs>